I am primarily a student of economic history. What I try to do is understand the, uh, the evolution of economic relations and how they provide a kind of conditions for the evolution of new ideas, institutions and identities. I study the evolution of uh, pilgrimage centers, the making of uh, vernacular languages, the history of uh, performance traditions, be it Kodiatam or uh, Carnatic music and so on. Uh, I study intellectual traditions, some of the esoteric or metaphysical traditions such as Vedanta as, for, as well as the more uh, science oriented traditions such as uh, astronomy or mathematics. So, you can actually see that I have a rather extensive field for myself. Well, my interest in history as an academic discipline must have begun when I was about 18 or 19 years of age. Uh, but even before that, I was fascinated by the idea of time. I realized that there are three academic disciplines which engage with uh, the question of time, physics, philosophy and history. Now, physics has uh, an approach to time at two levels. At one level, it is a measure and at the second level, which is closely connected to the first one, uh, time is an aspect of space and space is an aspect of time. The other discipline is philosophy and for some reason philosophers often reflect upon time without enabling them to engage with time itself. And there are many systems of philosophy within philosophy where time does not occur at all. That leaves me with history where uh, time is much more lively, uh, much more uncertain and much more uneven in the manner of speaking. Uh, history also enables the historians to orchestrate time in, in their uh, own ways. So that interests me uh, uh, to a great extent. Most people around us believe that uh, Hinduism is one of the oldest religions in the world, perhaps the oldest. What we today call Hinduism are of, uh, I wouldn't say is, it's are because there is a plurality there. They come from diverse sources and diverse origins and diverse encounters across a period of time. Most historians appreciate that and they would not say that Hinduism is as old as Harappa Mohenjadaro or as old as the Vedas. In spite of that, there is a belief that this is, is a centuries old religion. So that is what I call the primordialist position. The idea that Hinduism as a religion was constructed in the course of very recent historical developments, maybe the 19th century, even the early part of the 20th century, there you find uh, the, the, the idea of Hinduism gaining mass ground, you know, most of the pilgrimage centers become redefined as centers of uh, Hindu pilgrimage centers and there is one official philosophy of the, uh, the, uh, the Hindu religious group now, which is Shankaracharya's Advaita, which means that all other traditions are uh, of lesser importance. You know. So, this is the manner in which Hinduism has been produced in the course of the 19th and 20th century. So, that would be the, the constructionist position. When you look at uh, the historical processes between say 600 AD and 1800 AD, you see that land, ownership of land and ownership of the people who lived on the land which is more or less slavery to some extent, these were the decisive economic factors. By around 600 AD, the dominant practice is to recruit people into the service of the state for very specific services and they would be given a piece of land. The revenue from this plot of land would be this person's salary. Now the recipient does not own the land. The recipient only has revenue rights over the land, but he has the advantage that he is also getting free labor because there are people already settled on the land. So, they are the real cultivators, which means that there is a large, there is a large group of people who have access to land. There are multiple tires of access to the same plot of land. So, which means that I inherit land, not in terms of ownership alone, but also as a cultivator. This is what begins to disintegrate in the course of the 19th century with the bureaucratization of the mo of uh, most of the modern Indian states. So, under their new bureaucratic regime, what happens is the development of a new labor market where the principle is not based on heredity. 
So, this is uh, secular not in terms of uh, the dichotomy between secular and religious, this is secular because it is not inherited. Eric Hobsbawm and uh, Terence Ranger, they edited a book as early as 1983 and the book was uh, interestingly called The Invention of Tradition. So, one of the, it, it contains five or six essays and uh, the argument which the book was trying to put forth was that much of the things which we regard as tradition, which we regard as 500 or 1000 or 2000 years old is of very recent origin. There it was tradition that is invented, here he says that much of history is invented and I would completely agree with him. But this invented history has a great currency within India today and it's, it has a history of its own. I think there is no way that we can wish it away. But at the same, uh, same time, uh, we historians, the more responsible among us historians should also resist it in serious ways. It came as a surprise uh, to be honoured with uh, this recognition is I guess uh, uh, it increases one's intellectual responsibilities immensely and one has to live up with, with what is expected you know because this is now this is no mean honour. So uh, all eyes are looking at you now and they expect you to produce more fruitful research in the future. So that also came to my mind simultaneously. My message would be that researchers should not listen to messages because most of the messages that uh, experienced researchers uh, would have comes from very specific settings. Uh, their own experiences as researchers, their travels, their readings and uh, their engagement with a wide range of material and as well as with a wide range of people would have led to the development of a specific message. So, that I think may not be applicable to everybody. <laughs>